earlier this year I was teaching back east, and I pointed out the fact that in terms of the Four Noble Truths, the First Noble Truth is basically the clinging. We cling to the five aggregates, but the clinging is the suffering. And then later on in the talk I mentioned that there's got to be some clinging in the path. And someone in the audience said, aha, it caught me in a weak point. That means you're saying that there's going to be suffering in the path. And I said, of course. It's not the case that once you get on the path everything gets smooth and Teflon coated. Because you're going to be doing battle, doing battle with your defilements, and you're going to need some allies. This is why we practice concentration. All those jhanas are your allies. Mindfulness is your ally. All the good qualities you develop on the path are your allies. And you're going to have to hold on to them, because there's work that needs to be done, the kind of work that's done with patience. In other words, you stick with it, stick with it, stick with it, even when the results are not appearing right away. But you know that it's good work, and you learn how to give yourself pep talks. And part of those pep talks are meant to help you cling to what's skillful. So that when you let go of what's unskillful, you don't feel threatened. You don't feel like your world is going to be taken apart. That's one of the reasons we cling, is because we feel that we have to. We cling in an unskillful way, and we feel that we have to, for fear that everything would fall apart. And in a lot of ways, things will fall apart when you let go. All the bad things fall apart, but you need some alternative to hold on to. Otherwise, it's hard to let go. So right now, hold on to your breath. Any sense of well-being comes up. You don't hold on to it directly, but you still hold on to your breath, because you know that it's giving rise to a sense of well-being. And if the well-being hasn't come up yet, well, just keep holding on. And ask yourself, what am I doing that's making it uncomfortable? Because that's another part of the Noble Truths. We're not simply on the receiving end of the suffering. We're the ones who are doing it. Craving is something we do. Clinging is something we do. And if you can't get the mind to settle down in the present moment, what are you doing that's putting all those peas under the mattress? Sometimes they're not just peas, they're burrs on the mattress. And one of the difficulties of the path is that we have to admit that we're the ones that are placing those things there. Again, sometimes it's because we felt we had to. But that's the message of the Buddhist teachings, that regardless of how bad the world is, and how bad the people around us are. We don't have to suffer from that. And from the outside it may look like we're being passive, just accepting things as they are. But we're doing the work inside. Some things outside we can change, but a lot of things we have to let be so that we can focus on where the real problem is, inside. Like that telephone line worker I met in Paris. I was waiting outside the hotel. I was going to be taken to a talk. And I suddenly realized, here I am, exposed in the streets of Paris without a translator. What if somebody comes up and asks me a question? Sure enough, five minutes later, the telephone line man saw me. came running across the street and saying, you're just the person I wanted to see. Does Buddhism make you really happy? Does it make, give you peace? I said, yes, that's what I need in my life, he said. How do you do it? So I talked about looking inside, developing skills inside, including meditation. How do you meditate? Well, I was able to tell him that there was a website. Gave him the web, gave him the web address. He shook my hand. 
and I was waiting there at the front of the hotel because I was going to give a talk. And the talk was on the topic of, oh, we're not here just to be in the present moment, to accept it. We're in the present moment because we're going to go to something better by developing qualities, good qualities here in the present moment. And I told the people in the talk about the telephone line work, and I said, if I told him, well, just learn how to accept your job, because he said he was miserable with his job, he's surrounded by dishonest people. I said, well, just accept the job, accept how miserable it is, and accept your dishonest people, and you'd be okay. He would have had the good sense to walk away. We're not here just to accept. We're here to figure out what needs to be done. And what needs to be done is mainly an inside job. Right, John Fung's words, in Thai, in Thai it was a pun. He says there's the external what, which is the monastery, and then there's the internal what, which is your, your own protocols of your own meditation. He says sometimes you have to let the external what be not quite perfect so that we can perfect the internal what the internal protocols, because that's where the real problems are. I've seen some monasteries they are sp spanking clean. Everything is run very smoothly. Everybody behaves very properly. But people's meditation is a mess. I mean, ideally you want everything to be well run inside and well run outside, but if it has to be a choice, you focus on the inside. Because if you don't take care of your inside business, you're not only creating suffering for yourself, but you're making things miserable for people around you. So from the outside it may look like we're accepting things and just stopping there. But no, we're not stopping there. We're focusing on where the real problem is, which is inside, is that we're creating suffering. It's a message you don't like to hear, but again, this, the Buddha offers us the sense of well-being that comes from being generous, the sense of well-being that comes from being virtuous, and particularly the well-being that comes from getting the mind in concentration, gaining some insight into what's going on. That's the alternative that we hold on to. And you hold on to it not just as it is, but you hold on to it and keep making it better. And in John Fung's terms, you have to be crazy about the meditation to do it well. It means you have to be really attached to it. So we learn how to be attached wisely, be attached to the causes that give rise to the sense of well-being. And the well-being will have to come. So focus on what you're doing right here, right now, as you pick up stories from the past or pick up worries about the future, ask yourself, what am I doing right now? Why am I picking these things up? Isn't there something better I can pick up? Isn't there a better use of my time? Otherwise we just waste our time ruminating over things from the past or worrying about things for the future. And the past is gone. The future is not here. The one thing you do know about the future is that whatever is going to happen, you're going to need mindfulness and alertness for the unexpected. And where are you going to get your mindfulness and alertness? We get them by developing them now. As for tying up loose ends in the past, just leave them loose. The only closure there is in the world is awakening. Otherwise, we just go through life, and as we die, we leave a lot of loose ends, and then we get reborn and continue with the loose ends. But then we have more loose ends at the end of the next life. The only place you're going to find closure is here inside. And it's going to appear. The moment appears, it will be a right now moment. So you're looking at the right spot right now, something that you don't see. So try to develop your alertness, try to develop your mindfulness, get the mind 
as still as you can so you can see. Learn how to ask the right questions. Where is the stress? What is the stress? The stress is the clinging. Why is there clinging? There's craving. Why is there craving? There's ignorance. The ignorance of the fact that the stress is the clinging and the cause is the craving. But once you know that, make use of that knowledge. To remind yourself also that you have better things to cling to, better things to desire. And that's how the path takes hold. You've got to take hold of the path. You hear the stories of the Ajans going into the forest. And they're out there with wild animals and they don't take guns. They don't even think of killing at all. They have to think it's lots of goodwill. As the Buddha said, there come times when you're in the forest and fear comes up. So you think of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Take refuge in those. In other words, you follow the Buddha's teachings and tell yourself, okay, I've got to believe 100% that this is what's going to protect me. And so it's the people who've used that refuge that realize how strong it is. The same with any aspect of the path. It's when you use it that you realize it really is strong. If you pick it up and put it down, pick it up, put it down. It's not all that impressive. If you pick it up and hold on to it. So I'm not going to go back to my old ways, the old, my old protections. This is my protection now. That's when the refuge really becomes powerful. This is when the path becomes powerful, as you hold on to it. Not just as one of many options, but it's the option that gets, that's going to get you out. Whatever stress, whatever difficulties there are in holding on to the path, it's all to the good. It's better than the needless and pointless stress and suffering that we create otherwise. So as long as you haven't reached the end of the path, hold on to it. When you come to the end, that's when you let go. Because at that point you don't need to hold on to anything at all. <laughs>